Greetings and welcome. We are in our lecture number six on ACT grammar prep for LearnStrong.net. Uh, uh, to, today, for this lecture, we now turn to adjectives and adverbs. Um, uh, we've you know, already covered nouns, pronouns, verbs. It's time to turn to the modifiers, as we will often refer to them, these adjectives and adverbs. We've started each lecture um, kind of having a bit of fun, um, you know, showing that maybe this project can't be taken as seriously as some people want to take it. Um, so let's do a little bit more of that before we get to this discussion of modifiers. Watch this, for example. Um, when should you take the ACT for the first time? And how many times should you take it after you've taken it the first time? It's a legitimate question. Let's spend a bit of time with it. Most students, of course, World in High School's classic example, will take the ACT for the first time in their junior year, usually in the second semester of their junior year, so that way that they've got their uh, study of chemistry down to help them, obviously, on the, on the science section, right? After the score comes back, right, some, again, some score, uh, you know, between 0 and 36, uh, then students have to decide if they want to retake it again, and uh, that obviously leads to... Um, you know, some interesting discussion points. You can Google this on your own if you want to get into more detail about it. However, let's go ahead and point out that what makes the ACT so popular as a test among colleges and universities is that the ACT claims to have good reliability and validity. What does that mean? Let's take a few notes here really quickly. First of all, reliability means basically you get close to the same score every time you take the test, right? Uh, validity means that the test actually tests what it is supposed to test and measure. So it actually measures what the test is actually supposed to be tested, okay? Which means that it's really hard to game the ACT. If you write a 21, for example, the first time you take this test, it's hard to turn around a few months later and write a 25, 30, whatever, right? Not to say it can't be done. But it's very difficult to do. I mean, think about it this way. Um, if you could increase your score pretty easily, the ACT obviously wouldn't be considered a very good test, right? So what does all this mean for you, the student, the test taker? A couple of suggestions. One, uh, I recommend that you don't take the test until you're ready, until you've properly prepared for the test, if you get my drift right. I mean, I have students who take it in their freshman or sophomore year just so they can scout out the territory, they can take the test, get some sense of it. Um, you know, but I, I really do recommend that if you're going to do that, then you really do kind of see it as a game that you're playing in those, early, in those early years when you're taking it, right? Understand that you can improve your ACT score, but you must do a certain kind of prep work, or chances are you probably get close to the same score over and over again. I have students, and I know students, who have actually taken the ACT three, four, five times and gotten the exact same score every time, right? Um, ACT would say that's why it's a good test, right? Finally, realize that an ACT score does not, NOT, does not measure your intelligence or even your ability to do well in college, even though the test has obviously been used that way in the past. It simply measures, again, the ACT measures your ability to take a test. The better prepared you are for the test, obviously, you know, the, the higher the score. But again, don't forget what I'm about to say. It is crucial to understanding taking any standardized test, the SAT, the ACT. It is a three-hour reading test, okay? No matter how much you prep for the ACT, it is a three-hour reading test. And if you're not learning how to read under timed conditions, the kinds of material that is on the ACT, you will struggle, regardless of how prepared you are for the test. So you've got to begin to build your reading ability comprehension, especially under timed conditions. We talk about this um, in 303 as doing timed readings along with timed writings, timed readings, right? The next time we t uh, talk at the beginning of the next lecture, I'll talk a little bit about energy conservation and the energy conservation model as it relates specifically to taking the ACT. Let's turn now to our next study as we prepare for the grammar and usage section of the ACT. Speaking of prepping, well, right, um, just to review, right, to have a sentence in formal English grammar, you have to have a subject, a thing, a noun, a pronoun, a subject. Uh, it's got to be doing something, committing some kind of action. That's our verb, right? We've covered these 
parts of a sentence, what some people call, again, different parts of speech. It's time now to study modifiers. Okay, So let's talk about modifiers. What are modifiers? Well, think about this one. So when you modify a vehicle, what do you do? Well, you change it, right? You enhance it in some way. Okay? When you modify a noun or a verb, you also enhance it. That's all. That's all we mean by modifier. These words make our life so much richer, happier, and sometimes they can make our writing and speaking more effective. That is, of course, if we know how to use them well. Right? It's a significant distinction. The ACT loves to test your knowledge of how to use adjectives, adverbs. So let's sit up, take some good notes, let's get ready, all right, shall we? Now, there won't be as many what I would call silly rules in this lecture as I've used the term in prior lectures as we saw in those previous lectures, but these are important nonetheless, so let's pay attention. First of all, let's go to adjectives, then we'll go to adverbs. Just for fun, I recommend that you Google the word adjective so that you can see its etymology, that is to say, the source of the word itself. It comes uh, from the Latin to add to the noun, okay, is what it means. We modify nouns, we modify things with adjectives, simple. So, for example, we can talk about a house, or we can talk about a blue house. We can talk about a friend, or we can talk about loyal friend. By the way, it's always an interesting question. Why is it in English that we pretty much begin, uh, we always lead before the noun with the adjective, but, for example, in, a, in a Spanish, for example, we don't say the blue house, we say the house blue. Why is that? You, you do your own research. It's fascinating, right? Of course, these words enhance in almost unlimited ways, right? Did you see the ways in which the noun thing that I was, uh, um, that I was just talking about, uh, unlimited is the adjective that modified the noun, right? Ways, did you see that? I just played the game with you. Okay. <clears throat> adjectives can sometimes be hard to identify. For example, some nouns function as adjectives. Watch this one. Baseball is a noun. It's a thing. But in the sentence, the baseball game was exciting, Baseball now becomes an adjective, right? Some words neither look nor feel like adjectives. For example, the articles, right, that we've talked about already before, the, a, and, tell you whether a noun is specific, the train, or nonspecific, a train. This, that, those, these, and other pronouns, his, her, our, their, my, your. And words like many, much, few, and some all perform as adjectives depending upon context. For example, this faded shirt is mine. This, an adjective, right? Or for example, our adjective, our trip took four hours. The word our identifies whose trip it was. Let's talk about compound adjectives for a second because there are some rules here. Usually pairs of words, right? World famous, so-called, short term, well known, you can even string write three or four or five words together to make compound adjectives off the wall or never to be forgotten. By the way, important, hyphens separate the words in compound adjectives, but not every compound adjective needs a hyphen. Okay? Only compound adjectives that come before the noun they modify contain hyphens. I'll say that again. Only compound adjectives that come before the noun they modify contain hyphens. Those that follow the noun contain no hyphens. For example, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a world-famous actor and governor. The adjective world-famous modifies actor and governor and comes before, and therefore we use the hyphen. Right? Or, what about this example? Actor and governor Arnold Schwarzenegger was world-famous. Here the adjective follows the noun, so no hyphen. Just world famous, no hyphen. Let's talk about adjective phrases and clauses, something we need to pay attention to on the ACT. Let's remind ourselves, a phrase is a string of words that does not have a noun and a verb. A clause does have a noun and a verb. It can either be a full sentence, what we call an independent clause, or a partial sentence, what we call a dependent clause. We'll have more to say about this in another lecture as well. These string of words, phrases, and clauses act just like single word adjectives. So, for example, the snow on the grass melted, the noun, the thing, snow, is described or modified, right, by the phrase on the grass. This phrase is an adjective phrase, okay? Another example. A deer, that's a thing, right, that's a noun, hit by a car, there's your adjective phrase, lay on the road. Okay? Clauses, by the way, can, say, can play the same game. For example, this is the scene, scene here, noun, 
That always makes me cry, right? Most of the team, many of whom are really sore, decided to play in the final game, many of whom are really sore, obviously. You can see how this game's getting played. Now, one of the things ACT loves to test is your knowledge of comparing with adjectives. Now, this is something you probably don't know it unless you just learn it and you prepare for the ACT in this way, all right? So take good notes here as we go. Adjectives come in different forms that allow you to make comparisons. For example, smart, smarter, smartest. Thank you, thank you for the, the distinction right Degrees of comparison is what this is called, right? Indicated, of course, by endings, usually E-R or E-S-T, but also by the use of the word more or less and least, as in more brilliant, most talented, less gifted, least competent. Now, in English, we have three degrees of comparison, as we call it. I would definitely be taking notes now. Positive is our first tall, for example, or able. Then we have the comparative, which is the second, taller, abler, or more able. And then finally, what we call the superlative, that is to say, the best, tallest, ablest, or most able. Now, study how these are built. This is significant. Study how these are built. In the comparative degree, you're going to add the ending ER, or you're going to put more or less in front of the positive form. The superlative degree, we're going to add EST, or we're going to add most or least in front of the positive form. But, like everything, there's always exceptions to the rule, right? So, for example, good, better, best, or well, better, best. We'll get to the good, well distinction in a bit. Bad, worse, worst. No, we don't say worser. No, no. That's informal grammar. Little, less, least, much, more, most, many, more, most. Okay. By the way, did you notice that the E-R-E-S-T endings apply mainly to one-syllable words, late, later, latest? And the more, most, less, least pattern applies to words of two or more syllables, more famous. Two syllables. Most nauseous, less skillful, least beautiful. Some two syllable words follow the guidelines for words of one syllable. For example, pretty, prettier, prettiest. But saying more pretty or most pretty is not actually wrong. Can you appreciate why it is the case that when students who are not first uh, native speakers of, of English have to learn? Uh, English, it, we call it ELL or ESL, English is a second language. Can you, can you appreciate why sometimes this is a very demanding thing for, for, for rules like the ones we're going over right now? There's a few other interesting facts that ACT may test you on, so let's at least say that we know it. Three syllable adjectives and all adjectives ending in LY use the more, most, or least, less combination. Most luxurious less gladly. Also, the comparative degree, ER, is used to compare two things. For example, this test was harder than that one. Two tests here obviously being compared. Or, for example, this one. My younger sister takes dancing lessons. The speaker clearly has two sisters. The superlative degree, that's the EST, is used to compare three or more things. For example, this is the hardest test we've had all year. They've had at least three tests. Or how about this one? My youngest sister takes dancing lessons. The speaker has at least three sisters, or he would have said my younger sister. Make sense? Now, ACT will expect you to know these different constructions. All right? So I suggest you Google the list of these three degrees of adjectival comparison so you can study them like you did with the irregular verbs in Lecture 5. It's the ones you've not heard of before that will probably end up on the ACT. So that's how you want to take your notes. All right? Let's look a little closer at some issues here with comparisons. Some notes. Avoid creating double comparisons by placing more, most, less, and least in the same phrase with words in the comparative or superlative degrees. For example, never use 
more friendlier or less prouder or most sweetest or least safest, okay? These are faulty and they're redundant, all right? Some adjectives can't be used to make comparisons. You can't be deader or deadest, right? Nor more pregnant than someone else. The same is true for words like complete, final, square, full, superior, basic, empty, ultimate, fatal, perfect, and extreme. Also, hey, 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 beware of the word unique. It means one of a kind, right? So you can't be more unique or most unique. Okay. Finally, be mindful of the difference between adjectives less and fewer, all right? Again, you may not make distinctions in your normal speech and even in your writing, but in the, on the ACT, these are distinctions which will be made. For example, you use less to refer to singular nouns, less rain, less fighting. You use fewer for plurals, fewer people, fewer tickets, fewer voyages, for example. And you reserve fewer for things that can be counted, fewer children, fewer dollars, fewer cans of beans. And you save less to refer to nouns that can't or aren't likely to be counted. Less salt, less air, less hostility. Okay? And again, ACT will expect you to know these different constructions, so you got to prepare by reviewing them before you take the test. That's our conversation about adjectives. We'll come back to a, a few final comments on adjectives in a second. Let's now turn to adverbs, the other modifier. Or some have called it the first cousin to the adjective. Adjectives modify nouns, things. Adverbs modify verbs. They add to the verb. Right? Adverbs describe action, telling how, why, when, where, how much, in what way, to what degree an action occurred. They answer these questions. How did the action occur? When did it take place? Where did it happen? And so on. For example, Dad snored loudly. Loudly tells how Dad snored. Mom immediately poked him in the ribs. Immediately tells us when mom poked dad. Like adjectives, adverbs can also be a phrase, right? We call these adverbial phrases. A phrase that functions like an adverb, right? For example, she poked him in the ribs right away. Right away is an adverbial phrase telling us when she poked him, right? Adverbs modify verbs. Adjectives, other adverbs. Regardless, they always answer the questions of how, when, where, how much, in what way, in what manner. Example, for example, uh, dad is completely unaware of the sounds he makes. Here, completely is an adverb modifying the adjective unaware. Or, for example, all through the night he sleeps remarkably soundly. Note that in this sentence we have two adverbs, right? Soundly modifying the verb sleeps and remarkably modifying soundly an adjective. Okay. Many adverbs come directly from adjectives. By adding ly to an adjective, you've got an adverb. The ly is often not always a way to identify an adverb, right? Some adverbs, some adjectives, I'm sorry, end with ly and they are not adverbs. Lonely, sickly, daily, lovely, these are not adverbs, they're just adjectives. Let's comment about adverbial phrases and adverbial clauses. They function just like adverbs, right? Just like we were talking about with adjectives. Modifying verbs, adjectives, adverbs. For example, Dave is, there's your verb, without a doubt, that's your adverbial phrase, the school's worst student. Sorry, Dave. Not only uh, is uh, Dave undisciplined beyond belief, right? Undisciplined here is your adjective. Beyond belief is your adverbial phrase. He doesn't want to improve, okay? Look about this example. Unless the mail comes before noon, there's your adverbial clause, you will miss, there's your verb, the deadline. And then finally, Steve, example, even though he's old enough to drive, there's your adverbial clause, prefers to walk that is to say, there's your verb, to school. Now again, ACT loves to test your knowledge of how and where to place adverbs in sentences. So be careful when you put the adverb in a sentence because it can change the meaning, sometimes even radically, right? Watch the difference of, for example, these sentences. 
Reluctantly, I agreed to clean up the mess. Obviously, reluctantly here modifies the verb agreed, right? How about this one? I reluctantly agreed to clean up the mess. Here the adverb is placed after the subject, and it kind of weakens the emphasis on the speaker's reluctance. How about this one? I agreed reluctantly to clean up the mess. Here the adverb in the middle of the sentence loses much of the power. The speaker did the job, but didn't really like it, right? How about this one? I agreed to reluctantly clean up the mess. Whoa, notice here we have a shift. The adverb now modifies the infinitive verb to clean. Uh, notice that here we are splitting the infinitive. We're going to have more to say about this in a second, but hear it one more time. I agreed to reluctantly clean. To clean is the, in, is the infinitive use of the, word, of the verb clean. Finally, how about this one? I agreed to clean up the mess reluctantly. Now the adverb is at the end of the sentence, right? The only point here is word choice and word order matters, right? Well, what is this thing about splitting infinitives? Because many, many grammarians are going to point out no no's on this. Obviously, ACT is going to make sure you understand the concept, right? Uh, by the way, we do this all the time when we speak. Uh, just to remind, the infinitive form of a verb is the to form, to swim, to visit. Let's look at an example here, right? Um, an example of splitting uh, the infinitive, right? It felt creepy to, there's your beginning of the infinitive. After all this time, visit my elementary school, to visit, right? Notice it's split, right? You got the word to, then you got a string of words, then you got the word uh, visit afterwards. Here is the same sentence unsplit. It felt creepy after all this time to visit, there's your infinitive, my elementary school. Now we normally try to stay away from splitting the infinitive. However, let's point out that there are sentence construction where it actually seems maybe to make more sense to actually split the infinitive, right? For example,